It's Bob and Tony in Connecticut. Welcome to the show. Hi, Mr. Averill. Hi there. How are you today? It's a pleasure, Earl, and uh, I'm, uh, I want to thank you for your cooperation in uh, helping make this happen. I know you appeared on Tony's show a few weeks ago, and uh, we were biting at the... We just wanted to get you on the show so bad because of the uh, great, great feedback we've, we've, well, Tony's received from that show, and uh, it's an honor to have you on, and, and thanks again thank you, for sir. all your cooperation. We are, uh, we're very fortunate to have you, Earl, and we hope everything's going well out there in Washington. Uh, outside of it being a little bit wet, we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give our fans, uh, our viewers, a little background, Tony, and you could add to this. Uh, Earl signed by the Cleveland Indians as a free agent back in 1952. He made his major league debut in 1956 with the Cleveland Indians, later played with the Cubs, White Sox, Angels, and Phillies between 56 and 63. Son of Hall of Famer Earl Averill Sr. Earl has the distinction of sharing the Major League record, Tony, of reaching base 17 consecutive times, which he did in 1962. He shares that with a pre-1900 player. Piggy Ward was his name. <laughs> but um, again, uh, Earl uh, had a, a career again from 56 to 63. And uh, amazing some of the players and teammates going down the list that uh, he played with and we'll get to that as we go along but Earl my first question being the son of a former big leaguer I'm sure you've been asked this many times a legendary one at that Earl um, were you pushed at all in the direction of being a baseball player Earl in other words did you did you have that baseball mitt in the crib when you were a toddler <laughs> <Huh>. well <laughs> I think I had the I think I had my milk bottle I knew how to get in out of the refrigerator about age two. But uh I, I wish he had pushed me. Um he he dad was one of those that just kinda he he was so he was so good at the game himself that he I guess he figured everybody else would be should should come by it naturally. Wow. And uh, as far as, you know, we, we, we could read all day about stats about your dad, and we, I read Hall of, Hall of Fame induction things about him, but uh, maybe tell our audience your dad as far as how he was as a dad, as a person. Well, uh, the best thing I can say about him is I never heard dad get in an argument with anybody. Wow. Dad just would not confront anybody. Uh, Confrontation was not in his in his vocabulary. He was probably the easiest guy to get along with that you could ever imagine. And I don't ever recall him and mom ever having an argument. My goodness! And when he was elected to the Hall of Fame, uh, Earl, uh, a special day for the family. It must have been uh, really something you'll never forget. It was. It was a special day. We all went back there, except for my my just older brother, and uh, he he had a. He had to have a back surgery done about the time ah. Dad was on the podium. <laughs> Isn't that something? Uh, and Cooper's yeah, coming. he's the only one that missed it. And I know, uh, Earl, you went to school in Oregon and signed by Cleveland in 52, maybe to tell our audience how the uh, Cleveland organization came to show interest in your baseball talent. <laughs> yeah, pardon, pardon me for correcting you, but it was 1953. Oh, okay. And, uh, uh, Joe Gordon was... Uh, was a scout on the West Coast and had seen, obviously seen some of our, our games while I was at Oregon over the, over the uh, two, three years that I was there. Joe, had, Joe was, um, actually went to the University of Oregon prior to, to my going there. And uh, I got a call one day. Uh, I, had just, I had just graduated, but I hadn't taken my, uh, my final exams and asked me if, um, if I would like to go to Cleveland for a tryout, and uh, uh, I jumped at the opportunity. My wife had no clue that I was interested in playing baseball, and uh, so I went to Cleveland and I worked out uh, under the uh, guys of several several named pitchers that you probably would recognize: Red Ruffing, uh, Bill McKechnie, uh, Red Cress. There was uh, four or five of them that. That threw to me there for a couple of days, and uh, the Yankees were in town at the time, and uh, so I got to see a couple of ball games. And on a Saturday, they said, um, 
we'd like to sign you to a minor league contract. We're going to send you to the uh, the the A baseball team in Reading, Pennsylvania. You'll take a train out of here tonight, and, and you'll arrive in Schenectady, New York, tomorrow morning, and you'll join the club for the ball game tomorrow afternoon. And that's the way it went. That's how it all started. Uh... And as we talk to Earl Averill, uh, guys, we have a nice collage we'll be showing on the screen, uh, certain different baseball cards of Earl and uh, different parts uh, of his career and uh, nice time frame. There it is right there. Actually, has a picture of Earl in the, in the center, a uh, more recent picture. I think it was taken at Oregon, Tony. But uh, question, Tony. And uh, Mr. Averill, good evening. It's a pleasure once again. I, Hi there. Uh, how are you? And, and I um, wanted to talk with you. We sort of, uh, we had a number of things when we were talking in New Haven. This is something I really, as I thought about it, I wanted to ask you more of. You're a young catcher. You're coming up on this Indians club. And man, you got some incredible pitchers there. And, um, Bob Lemon and Herb Score and Bob Feller and uh, Mike Garcia. And I mean, what, uh, was it intimidating? And uh, how was it like to work with these guys? Well, um, I, it was probably intimidating for them, but not for me. <laughs> um, uh, uh, they were, you know, um, early win, early was uh, as good natured as anybody could be until somebody hit, hit a line drive through the box and then he was a terror. <laughs> but but um, early was easy to catch, uh, he was easy to call a ball game for. If he didn't didn't like what you called, he simply shook you off. It was and uh, early early had the ability to change speeds on his own, and he would do it um, kind of out of impulse. It would uh, the pitch would get he'd be near the end of his windup, and he'd decide to take maybe maybe a foot or two off the ball, if you will, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, he was very good at it. And of course. He would, he also threw um, a lot of high sliders, and uh, it was a high ball pitcher uh, for that for that fact. And uh, a lot of those balls get popped into the air. And uh, 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 Bob Lemon had as good a natural stuff as anybody ever hoped to have. His ball was absolutely alive. Mm -hmm. And the best story I can tell you is the first day in spring training. In uh, I think it was probably 1955 or 56, and I had caught him in batting practice, and he threw good batting practice. I mean, you could you put the ball in there so you could hit it. And I remember uh, I was the Giants were had come over from Phoenix, and the first pitch he threw to me, that ball just exploded right in front of the plate, almost knocked my glove off. And uh, I've forgotten who the umpire was, but I turned around and says, "Oh, did you see what happened?" He says, you haven't seen nothing yet. So I knew I was in for a long day. And as, I recall, as I recall, I think I got eight foul balls in the arms and chest and legs off of him that day. Oh, I, I, it was, he, he, was, he just had fantastic stuff. No wonder, you know, it's no wonder he won as many games as he did. Mm -hmm. And that 56 season, Tony, as you mentioned, Three twenty game winners. This is Earl's first year. Uh, he goes to Cleveland. Three twenty game winners. Of course, we're reminded of the four twenty game winners for the Orioles in the early seventies. But uh, this was back when Lemon Herb Score. And, and that's what I wanted to ask, mm -hmm. Mr. Averill. It, uh, Herb Score is kind of lost to baseball history. How good would he have been if he had continued? Well, if if you couldn't compare Herb to uh, Sandy Koufax, he's a he's a clone of Sandy. Oh. They both had they both had tremendous fastballs. They both had excellent curveballs. And little known fact about Sandy Koufax, he had an excellent changeup, oh, and yeah. so did her. Well, if you take anything off a fastball like they had, right? It's just <laughs> you're coming out, and it's coming to be <laughs> tough to hit. But uh, that it, it just amazed me reading the stats of those pitchers. Even Mike Garcia didn't win 20 that year, but my goodness, the numbers. Yeah. And this was when Bob Feller was at an advanced age, uh, Earl, and um, 37 years old, uh, still 
had something in the tank, pitched a few good games. Now, I, I just had to ask you, if Feller didn't do the time in the military, the guy is already a Hall of Famer. What kind of numbers would this guy have put up? <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> Dad, well, uh, Dad told it best. He said, you know, he was about as close to you know, unhittable as anything that he'd ever played with or against. Mm -hmm. And Dad ended up breaking up one of his no-hitters. And I asked Bob about it. He says, yeah, he, he hit a ball off the fist over the shortstop's head. <laughs> so, you know, that's the type of, of stuff that Bob had. He had a, he had a huge fast-breaking curveball and a fastball that was in the high 90s. Yeah. Uh, and it, the ball moved. It, it, you see a lot of guys today throw the ball, throw the ball in, the, in the 90s, but their ball is straight. And there's a, there's a big difference. I, my father, probably one of his favorite players of all time, was Feller. And I tell Tony the story, Earl, that my father went to school with Feller's wife and actually carried her books to school. Anne Gilliland was her name at the time. It's a small <laughs> world. Back in the, uh, the th 30s, 30s and 40s, 30s, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and again, she went on to marry Bob Feller, and uh, I met Feller once. Earl, you know, we heard about that he was a gruff guy at times and everything. Well, I met him at a minor league game. He was making an appearance back in the 80s in West Haven, Connecticut, and uh, he was signing autographs, and uh, my friend and I got, got an autograph from him, and we actually asked him at one point, you know, Mr. Feller, if you if you get done, could you come sit with us in the stands? We'd like to ask you a couple questions. And we didn't think he'd even know who we were or would probably, we, we assumed he would just kind of just take right off from the ballpark. Well, about the fifth inning, we see Feller come out, and he's looking up in the stands for He actually came, Earl, sat with two 18-, 19-year-old kids for uh, a, a good two innings, and get, we asked, probably six, seven questions each, and we were just so amazed. Got an autographed baseball, which is a prized possession of mine. So, uh, Feller, that was probably one of the highlights of uh, my baseball life and following the game was just sitting watching a minor league game with Bob Feller. Amazing. And reminiscing about a lot of the things we're talking about. So, uh, really amazing. Well, yeah, Bob was known, the ball player, we called him Kinky. And the reason uh, I, I think he acquired the name because he had incorporated early on in his career. Mm -hmm. But I thought the name meant, before I found out what the true meaning of the word was, that he used to take um, a stack of magazines and uh, envelopes and, and uh, stationery down to the bullpen when he wasn't working, and he'd go through the back of the magazines and he'd pick up uh, all, you remember those, all the ads in the back, and he'd write for stuff. And he then closed, he took his checkbook, he'd write a check, send for this stuff, and when we get back off of road trips, it took an extra locker just to carry the stuff that he'd received while we were on the road. There's a story you won't hear. <laughs> Only a Monday night sports story. Right. <laughs> Again, we're, yeah. uh, we're privileged to be on the phone with former Major Leaguer Earl Averill, uh, Tony. Question. And, you know, Mr. Averill, we had talked for a while in New Haven about Roger Maris. As I had explained to you, we have a lot of old Yankee fans, and I'm going to qualify that again, old Yankee fans who really loved Roger. And Could you give this group of fans that are watching tonight your particular memories of Roger? Well, I played with uh, Roger at uh, Indianapolis and, uh, and at uh, Reading in the minor leagues. And if there was a better teammate, I don't know who it would have been. Um, quiet, quiet, not 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 unspoken to, but uh, reserved. Um, but yeah, he was a lot of fun. Um, Roger go and have have a beer with him. There was nothing wrong with that. But uh, he wasn't a pop off. He wasn't. Uh, he was just. He was more of a humble guy, but. He could play right field as good as anybody. He could throw the ball. He could catch the ball, and he could run the bases. He was, I, I think I said in my interview with you last time, that he was a lot like Hank Aaron on the bases. Not flashy. You just never threw him out. Very smart ball, but we heard a lot about that. And yeah. underrated and you yeah, remember the, the base running, you never hear about. No, no, and all the other little things that... Uh, 
he did well. But um, and I'm looking at some of Mr. Averill's teammates in uh, Cleveland, Tony. Some names just in baseball lore that we've come to know. Vic Wirtz. Yes. Rocky Calavito, Al Rosen, and then, of course, we've mentioned the mem members of that amazing pitching staff. You also had guys like Mickey Vernon, Vic Power, Minnie Minoso. If you're a big baseball fan, you know these names. Larry Doby, mm -hmm. uh, Jim Mudcat Grant. <laughs> a young right, Mudcat Grant, yeah. Hoyt Wilhelm, and we can go on and on. Cal McClish, you're one of the few that can <laughs> say his entire name, right, Tony? I think so, yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, let's see. Mr. Averill was at Calvin Coolidge, Julius Caesar, William Francis uh, Tuscahoma McLish. Did I get them? <laughs> you're, you're pretty close. Sir. <laughs> Had a very good year. Yeah. Well, Cal, you know, Cal was, a good, was an awfully good friend of mine. And I, I ended up playing with him again at the Phillies in 63. But I used to see him in the wintertime. And one of the conversations that always came up was, how did you pitch to Ted Williams? And Cal was one of the guys that was fortunate enough to get him out a number of times. There's a lot of guys that couldn't. And um, so Cal said, well, he says, I pitched him uh, probably just as backward as anybody could pitch, but he says, I would intentionally get behind him so I could throw my change up to him. He says, I got him out of my change up. Got him right and it worked up. for him. And, you know, God bless his heart. He's, <laughs> he's no longer here, but uh, he had good luck against him. He became a pitching coach, right, Earl? Yeah, he was a – Cal was well thought of in, in the, any organization he was he was uh, associated with. And little be known to anybody, he was a – he wrote poetry. Huh. And he could recite poetry about just about anything that you wanted to know about. But you had to get him in the right mood to get him to tell you them. Wow. That's something. Cal McClish. You would only know. I just remember him as a pitching coach for the Expos. Yes. Yeah, for that, sure. That is amazing. And uh, Earl, then you end up with the Cubs. You're sent to Chicago uh, from Cleveland, 1959. Now, Cub teammates, Tony, Ernie Banks, Bobby Thompson. We're mm -hmm. talking about major mm -hmm. names in the game of baseball. baseball. history. Mo yeah. Drabowski, Dale Long. Uh, again, these are trivia question uh, names. Art Checkerelli. Art Checkerelli was a distant relative of my father's, Earl, believe it or not. Uh, Richie Ashburn, Don Zimmer. Uh, and I, j I just have to ask you what it was like playing in, well, the first Wrigley Field you played in, the one with the uh, Ivy uh, in Chicago. <laughs> How is it out there? Uh, you talk about uh, the pureness of baseball, right, Earl? Yeah, that was, uh, Wrigley was the first time that I had a chance to eat dinner at night at home because, of course, that time we were all day games. But you mentioned Art Ciccarelli, and if you're interested in a little, cute, little, cute little story, I'll tell it to you. Absolutely. It, ha it, it happened in uh, Milwaukee. And Art's, uh, Art's pitching, uh, being a left-hander, he's pitching that starting the game. And early on in the game, uh, Aaron gets up with a, with, with a man on, I think. It was, maybe it was even in the, in the first inning. And Art gets ahead of him, and he strikes him out on a high fastball in on him. And so the next time Aaron comes up, I don't want to start him off with another, another fastball. I'm going to throw him the breaking ball. Or, anyway, work him in a different manner. Art's determined. He's going to get him out on the fastball up. Well, the last time I saw it, it went almost over the flagpole in dead center field in Milwaukee. And Art says, well, I think I've learned my lesson about throwing high fastballs to, to Hank. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> You know, I, I didn't get a chance to talk to Mr. Ceccarelli too much, Earl. We would, we'd always meet at these terrible occasions, Tony's funerals, wakes, yeah. because uh, distant relatives. But he would always uh, take me aside, knowing I was a, knowing I was a big baseball fan, and, and tell me stories just like that. But uh, mm -hmm. big, big gray hair guy, nice guy. But uh, my goodness, yeah, Art was, Art was an awfully nice guy. Yeah. Uh, again, folks, on the phone with uh, Earl Averill, Tony. And, uh, Mr. Averill, you get expanded to the Angels in 1961, and you're playing in the other Wrigley Field, and it's this crazy Hollywood environment and all the stuff that's going on in Hollywood. Was that a distraction, or did you guys really enjoy, you know, kind of uh, some of the crazier stuff that took place? 
Well, uh, there was crazy stuff in that. Uh, uh, there was always, seems like there was always celebrities around, but uh, the, that didn't affect most of us normal people. <laughs> if you will. Grounded, but, grounded. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there was there was guys like Buddy Luster hanging around. Well, Buddy was a friend of Ted Kaczynski's, and they liked to golf together. Mm. And Buddy Luster used to say. You know, Clue's got this. Clue's got this wedge that he hits, and it's a, it's a 140 yard wedge, and it's great. He says we get on a 180 yard hole, and he hits 140. We get on a 90 yard hole, he hits 140. <laughs> he says he says Clue's got a one club, and he hits it 140 yards, no matter what happens. <laughs> <laughs> that was a strong man, Ted Glazuski. Uh, oh, he was, yeah. Ted really, was fun. He was one of those first guys that you noticed his arms, Tony, when under He the... didn't wear the undershirt. <laughs> <laughs> no, and he, 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 if he, you know, he, he rolled his sleeves up underneath, too. Yeah, he didn't wear any undershirt. He just wore the, he, he cut, the, cut the sleeves out of it. That's interesting. But he was, he, was, he was a gentle giant. He was really, really fun. And some of those teammates out in Los Angeles. It's it, first of all, it, it was amazing to me that uh, Earl uh, reconnected with ex-teammates such as Early Win, Herb Score, Tony when he was with the White Sox. Yes. believe it or not. But back in L.A., talk about some names. Tony, Daddy Wags Wagner played mm -hmm. on that team. Uh, Ken Aspromonte, Ryan Durant. Now Dean Chance. Dean Chance was a 20-year-old the first year you were there. The uh, second year, he started coming into his zone. Uh, did you have obviously you had a chance to catch him a little bit? Did you think he was going to be as good as he was, Earl? Well, Dean had, Dean was another guy with a live arm. Yeah. But uh, uh, here, here's a little known fact about Dean: you, you had to you had to be in a hurry to catch because he as soon as he got the ball back to the mound, he was bringing it. Yeah. And if you didn't get, he was he was taking signs while he was winding up. And you had to you had to give the sign because the ball was coming, and Dean, Dean didn't have a great arm because he he's one of these guys that could uh, just we call them rubber arms, but uh, basically two or three tosses and he was ready to go. Yeah, very very good. When he got to Minnesota, Tony really. My father used to say, "Chances pitching today, we have to watch." This yeah, game. he was that that type of electric type talent and uh, I should say Earl had his best year Tony with the Angels 1961 at 21 home runs uh, playing mm -hmm. in 115 games and that was in the other Wrigley the Field other Wrigley now field. tell us about that was it uh, a home run hitting friendly for you Earl well, I guess it was I, <laughs> I, I actually hit the first home run in that park wow and, and I found out that I, I thought I hit the last one in there too <laughs> but I didn't but the last one I hit there this is this is this is this is more truth than 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 fact than fact more fact than fiction. I hit a ball over the left fielder's head and it hit on top of the fence. And the top of the fence at Wrigley Field the old, in L.A. was a was a broad uh, cement base, maybe maybe ten inches on the top. The ball bounced up in the air, hit on the top of the fence the second time before it went over. So I didn't waste any effort at all. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that something? The uh, old Wrigley Field, that's uh, something. And uh, we talk often, and Tony brought up the, the kind of the Hollywood aspect. When you think of Hollywood, the Angels, the 60s, Bo Belinsky. We were comes, talking about Bo right? yesterday, Mr. Avery. <laughs> now, Bo Belinsky, first pitcher, he had to have a little talent, uh, Earl, because he did throw the first no-hitter on the West Coast, but... Uh, do you think he could have been a better pitcher if if his if he, I guess what can we say if his total he wasn't so concentration <laughs> was on baseball I guess. Well, Bo, Bo had a good screwball, uh, mm -hmm. and I don't think he, he he probably would have been a better pitcher if he knew if he realized that he actually had better command of his other pitches than he realized. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a really sharp breaking ball. But he had a good screwball. He had a decent fastball. Uh, he never did learn to, to really change speeds. So they, uh, they they caught up with him eventually. But, um, no, he had, he, both could have been a half decent. Yeah, he more, was... More effective than he was. But he got 
He got tangled up pretty good in the Hollywood crowd. Oh, God. I was just going to say, he was dating the supermodels and the Hollywood starlets before Namath and all of these yeah. guys came around. But uh, he Well, is... Walter Winter was in the clubhouse half the time. <laughs> that, talking that, to Bo. That tells you pretty much that's Bo, right? Uh, yeah, got a few yeah, couple yeah. more minutes left with uh, Earl Averill, Tony, and, and Earl ended up uh, with the 63 Phillies. Yeah. Teams, uh, yeah, like Bobby Wine on that team, Chris mm -hmm. Short. Now, I, we always talk about Richie Allen. Was he on that team when you got there, Earl? No. Oh, he, okay. No. Um, Richie, Richie was one strong individual. Oh, we, oh so, man. He, you know, he had an upper... He had an upper body like nothing and like a 32-inch waist and just was built like an atlas, you know. And uh, he, he, you know, he used a fairly heavy bat and became a, he put up some, he put up some big numbers. Well, Tony and I often talk and Tony has showed me pictures of the home run he hit off Don Cardwell that went over the, the Coca-Cola sign at, uh, at the Philadelphia, the Phillies Park, right? County Mac Stadium, County Mac Stadium that, that's still traveling, that kind of power. He was, uh, Richie was something. Let's just say uh, Bo Belinsky had his kind of uh, yeah. way, and Richie had his way. And guess what? Uh, Richie was one talented hitter, as we talk about very often, Tony. But, um, but you, you, you just mentioned Don Cardwell. Did yeah. you realize that he's the only player that was ever traded and pitched a no-hitter in his first game? So that's something. Didn't There's a that. good trivia question. Yeah, he was traded. He was traded from the Phillies to the Cubs when I was there, for uh, I think it was Tony Taylor, and he shows up and he pitches a no hitter against the Cardinals. Wow, that's a great trivia question. Good, Cardwell. Uh, we remember with the match. With the match, mm -hmm. yeah, '69. Oh, my goodness, and. Uh, one more question, uh, Earl. When you had the 17 consecutive times reaching base, now in '62. Did, was this something, did you know at the time that you were approaching uncharted territory, uh, or was was it a time when st stats like that were so um, not even considered, or you, did you know it was something special was happening at the time? I had no clue, right? to tell you the truth. <laughs> hmm. You know, I didn't find out about that, or the significance of it, until I was out of baseball. <laughs> and some, somebody, you know, they started putting all these all these uh, things together. For, for instance, somebody somebody called me from, from Sabre here a few months ago and said, do you realize that you're one of the few major league ball players that actually hit a home run in a major league park that was once a minor league park? Well, that was Wrigley Field in L.A. Because yeah. I had hit a home run when I was in the Coast League ah. playing in L.A. And then I go to the big leagues as, a, as an angel. And we're playing there, and I hit another home run. But there's been very few guys that have actually hit home runs as a minor leaguer in the same part that they hit a home run in when they became a major leaguer. Wow. So this trivia about 17 consecutive, uh, reaching base 17 times, it, it, it consumed more than, there's probably a couple of hit batsmen in there, too. <laughs> uh, I, and... Uh, uh, well, uh, I, and I just about bet you it was an error in there when I hit a, a routine ball to Brooks Robinson, and he made the only error he made in ten years on a on a, on a, on a, on a gimme. Uh, you had luck that was in there. You were you had some luck going for you too. Okay, here. Yeah, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, that helps. Yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense when you think about it because uh, there's no way that it, that it should happen. <laughs> It's something. I mean, I, that doesn't surprise me, your answer, because I didn't know about it until I did some research on it. That, that's tremendous, though. It, it really is is some feat. Tony, final question. Yeah, and uh, Mr. Averill, what uh, was your path after leaving baseball? What did you get involved in? I got into the computer arena when I got out of the get out of baseball and did a little programming on my own and uh, joined a couple of guys to, to do some work. And then... Um, I did some. I, I worked for Claremont Men's College. Now it's Claremont McKinney, McKenna. Mm -hmm. I did fundraising for them in development. Uh, got out of that and had the most fun and enjoyment as a salesman. Actually, early on with Radio Shack selling 
selling computers, and then I went into the consulting business on my own, working for businesses with uh, basically less than 12, 15 employees. Well, very interesting. Very and I know he's out in Washington now, a beautiful state. I've had the opportunity to travel out there, and I know you follow the Mariners pretty closely, Earl, and uh, mm -hmm. the fans aren't too happy with the way things have been going over the past few years. Few years. I, I would imagine that's the feeling out there now, but hopefully uh, they'll be able to pick things up. Um, but uh, I, I assume that you still keep your eye on the game pretty closely uh, about what's going on throughout the league. I watch about eight or ten games a night. Now, the, I guess <laughs> that is blood. Yeah. It isn't. Right now, literally. Right now, football, football's on, but it's going off in a minute. <laughs> Well, Earl, our time is up. Uh, again, our time has flown by, and, and we are honored to talk to you. Uh, and uh, it's been such a f fun time getting to know you and, and doing some research on you. And I know Tony is very, very thankful for, for appearing on his show Extremely, first. Mr. Averill. Thank and, you. And uh, we can't thank you enough, and we'd like to talk to you again sometime. And, and, and until then, please keep in touch and stay well, my friend. All the best, sir. Well, well you too. If you get out of here, be sure to come by. Oh, uh, thank you. Wouldn't that be nice? Thank you. Thank you, sir, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Bye. Good night, Earl.